Bring John in as uh, we get ready for the NFL playoffs this weekend. Not a lot of Eagles stuff happening, but there is some. We'll touch on that first. Johnny Mack is back here on 97.3 ESPN. John, welcome back, pal. How uh, I, I saw that you shoveled a lot of snow and were not happy about the uh, what I was deeming as the blizzard apocalypto. Yeah, or bomb site, whatever the heck they called it. Yeah, I'm not happy. Let's put it that I didn't realize. I, I figured your so, arms would not even be able to hold the phone up today to do this conversation. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm getting too old to shovel snow. <laughs> and you're talking about somebody who lived in uh, Minnesota for about ten years. So wow. I got to get Florida in my my sights yes. at some point. Uh, John, Joe Douglas is up for uh, the Texans job. And, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about assistance, and, and they, you know, they might lose DeFilippo, they might lose Schwartz. Uh, but Joe Douglas, number one, how serious of a candidate do you think he is around the league and specifically for this job? And number two, would he be a bigger loss than one of the coordinators or the QB coach? Well, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, when you talk about the level of loss, I think they would all be significant, whether you look at Jim Schwartz, John DiFilippo, Joe Douglas. Uh, I think that's uh, they've all been very important to this team's success. Uh, but when you look at sort of what they do in the organization, I mean, Joe is obviously – uh, right there putting together this roster, which has turned out to be one of the best in the NFL. And it's turned around very, very quickly uh, from being a poor roster uh, to a top 10 roster. So you have to give him a lot of credit. He runs the day-to-day operations of the scouting department. And you have to give Howie Roseman a lot of credit as well. Maybe the most impressive thing about Joe to this point, it's very early in his tenure here, is the fact that he's been able to work with Howie Roseman because there's a long list of guys who haven't been able to work with him. Uh, So the fact that you have somebody in that position uh, that has been able to flourish, uh, you don't want to lose him. I I don't think he's the favorite by any estimation. I think Brian Gain is the favorite in Houston to return there. Uh, And the Eagles uh, don't have to give – the Texans don't have to grant the Texans permission at this point. You can uh, refuse an interview for a GM candidate as long as you're in the playoffs. So uh, I, I don't think it's it's an urgent situation right now, but it's, it's certainly no surprise that his name is going to start popping up in these types of searches because he's done such a good job. Right. Um, a lot of people um, brought up what you would bring up what you brought up is the fact that he was able to work coinciding with Howie Roseman in, instead of bashing heads with him, which a lot of guys have done uh, in the past. And um, do you think that uh, his name will come up for uh, there's not a lot of GM openings, right? Or do you think there, that there some things will fall after uh, the playoffs are done? No, I, I don't think there's going to be too many more. I, I think, you know, from this point forward, uh, not necessarily this year, but moving forward down the line, uh, I think as he continues to progress in his career, because remember, uh, he was not a high-profile guy, even though he was very important in Baltimore. Then he made the move to Chicago, started getting on people's radar. Uh, and now he's really on the radar here in Philadelphia because he's done such a good job. And that's generally uh, the way it works in this league. You, you make your way up incrementally in, in personnel departments, and he's on the cusp of, of being in these conversations uh, for years moving forward. And, you know, the best indication to that are Eric DaCosta, another guy in Baltimore that was ahead of him. He constantly see his name. George Patton, who's Rick Spielman's lieutenant in Minnesota, you constantly hear his name. So there's, again, there's no urgency for one reason. I I mean, a lot of these guys are smart, and and they want to take the best potential situation, and that's why I brought up uh, DeCosta and Patton, because they constantly get interviews year after year after year but they never want to leave where they are because they have good jobs and good situations. Hopefully the Eagles have created that for Joe Douglas, and we'll see uh, moving forward. 
Hey, John, uh, did you think that the Joe Douglas move was going to work out the way that it did? And, and did you know a lot about him coming in, that he was able to find talent in the way that he has? Well, I, I don't think anybody uh, knows that much. They can say it, but you just look at where they they come from and their pedigree. And, and for Joe, it was more Baltimore, which has always been, I would say, right there with Green Bay as having the top reputation in this league as far as scouting. So the fact that he was in that organization uh, for so long was very, very positive uh, uh, sort of check mark in, in uh, in his, you know, corner. But uh, to say he would do this kind of job and, and turn this team around so quickly, remember, Chip Kelly kind of ran this into the iceberg as far as the roster went. Uh, so you have to give Joe and Howie Roseman a ton of credit for being, being able to rebuild this thing so quickly. Uh, and he's certainly a, a, a big part of it. If you remember... When when the when Jeffrey Lurie did his 180 and, and went uh, away from Chip Kelly and fired him and, and brought Howie sort of back from the other side of the building in exile, uh, he he made one caveat. He said, "You have to go out and hire a personnel guy to run the day-to-day operations uh, of of the scouting department." And that was Joe Douglas, and it it, it looks like Howie Roseman hit a home run because he's done a tremendous job. And you see, if you look at the trades, if you look at the signings, if you look at the history, whether it's all Sean Jeffrey had him in Chicago, Tim Jernigan had him in Baltimore, even a, a Donnell Ellerby coming up, you know, as a veteran guy, won a Super Bowl in Baltimore. They all have sort of Joe's fingerprints on him. So he's, he's been a big part of this entire thing. With that said then, John, do you think people around the NFL give – more credit for the turnaround to Joe, or do they give it to Howie Roseman? Well, it depends who you are, really. I, I mean, I, I think they've they've worked in concert, and, and I think Joe, as I said, Joe is responsible for the scouting department and, and doing the heavy lifting as far as that goes. So when you look at draft and free agent signings, uh, he deserves a lot of cre- uh, credit for that. And, and when you talk about Howie Roseman uh, being able to sign players to these unique contracts, and, and even though the Eagles seem to be up against the cap, he's always creating space. Uh, I think it's it, it's a great uh, duo, and they've worked well together. And I think they both deserve a lot of credit. Hey, you mentioned Ellerby a minute ago there. What will his role be? I mean, did he do enough? in the meaningless game against the Cowboys to show Jim Schwartz that he should be given more playing time? Yeah, I mean, Jim's already admitted uh, he's he's the starting middle linebacker now, and obviously Joe Walker's on the injured reserve, so his season's done. Uh, so that was what they were working for. I, I think when he came in here, he probably wasn't uh, ready from bar- being in football shape, but that was always the Eagles' plan uh, was to get him ready uh, to be the starting middle linebacker. Now, remember, since Jordan is out with the torn Achilles, that's become a sub package position. It's not one of the three down linebacker positions any longer, like it was when Jordan was healthy. So that still belongs to Nigel Bradham and Michael Kendrick. So you're only talking about a guy who's going to play 30% of the snaps, maybe on a good week. But nonetheless, he's, he's a veteran. He understands how to play. He's much more physical than Joe Walker. Uh, so that should help the Eagles defending the run. Not that that's been an issue all year, obviously, because they're the number one ranked defense in the NFL against the run. So big picture wise, John, you've got a team that in less than a month, they had Carson Wentz odds on favorite to represent the NFC in the Super Bowl. And then they get to, you know, on their to do list. I mean, when they're heading into a playoff game, Get the quarterback feeling good about himself is not necessarily what you want at the top of your to-do list, right? No, probably not. And, and uh, you know, I, I look at it with hindsight. After after the Oakland game, I, I really think the Eagles should have went in the direction of not even playing Nick uh, against the Dallas Cowboys uh, because the weather was so uh, difficult. It, 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 it just, you know, 
he's not the type of quarterback, I mentioned it before, that's going to be able uh, to cut through that cold air with the wind chills and the teens. Uh, he, he doesn't have that kind of arm strength. So I think it would have been wiser to just put him in bubble wrap because I think he did affect his, his confidence in a negative direction. Uh, and now you do have to spend the time rebuilding. I think the most positive development for the Eagles as we sit here in, in South Jersey as a whole to get ready for the coldest weather of the season is the fact that it's going to warm up next week. And now we're talking about into the 40s and it might rain. Uh, and I think that's great for the Eagles. Hmm. Uh, they don't want it uh, at 10 degrees because Nick Falls has proven he cannot play in that weather. Yeah, the bad weather is supposed to warm up a little bit. I'll be at the game, by the way, John, uh, just in case you're – Oh, wondering if I'm going to be out there as a fan. I'll be sitting in those stands, uh, maybe getting wet. Uh, you know, Doug did text a few people after that press conference, too, to say, like, Nick is my quarterback. That's a little unusual, right? Well, I think because people took what he said the wrong way. Uh, you know, I, I think oftentimes uh, people who aren't there will will hear a quote and take it out of context. And it, it, all Doug said is in a, a one-and-done situation, as every playoff game is, it's sort of, if you think about it, it, it's sort of like a game seven in the baseball playoffs. It's all hands on deck. I, I mean, if disaster strikes, yeah, you could possibly think, uh, about changing quarterbacks. You, you'll try to do anything to win a football game in advance. Uh, but people kind of took that and said, well, maybe he's thinking about making a change or maybe uh, Nick's on a short lease. Later in the same press conference, he was asked, well, how many how many first-team reps is Nate Sudfeld going to get leading up to the game? And his answer was uh, a pretty emphatic, zero, none. He's not preparing Nate Sudfeld to play. Uh, he was just making a comment that's a common sense, really. In, in a one-and-done situation, you scratch and claw to try to do everything to win a particular football game. But Nick Foles is the Eagles' starting quarterback, and there's there's no question about that. Uh, John McMullen's with us, 97.3 ESPN.com. Follow him on Twitter at JF McMullen. Let's look at some of the NFL stories uh, one of which is John Gruden will be the next Raiders head coach. That's not really the story. It's 10 years, $100 million that becomes more of the story. I, I like it, John Gruden, to like the Eli Manning of uh, coaches. He's got that Super Bowl. Now, Eli has two, but everything around those Super Bowls has kind of been, you know, mediocre. Yeah, it's probably a, a, a nice little comparison. He's he's a good coach. He's not a great coach. Uh, and if you look at that contract, I mean, you know, John has had obviously a very high-profile position. He's done a wonderful job sort of building his own personal brand to get to this point. Uh, you, you mentioned the 10-year deal at $10 million per year. Makes him the highest-paid coach in the NFL. <laughs> Bill Belichick, Bill Belichick gets seven point five million dollars a year, and John Gruden's coming in at ten million per year. Uh, you know, it's, hey, we should all have that agent. I'll just say that. Yes, uh, I, that's an awful contract by an awful owner with an awful organization that has no idea what it's doing. <laughs> well said. Uh, your take on this Patriots um, crack starting to show? <laughs> well, it's similar. I, you know, I just mentioned Bill. I, I, Seth Wickersham is a wonderful reporter. He does a tremendous job. But I mean, what are you trying to say? There's cracks in the Patriots. They're thirteen and three. They're number one seed in the AFC. They're the favorites to go to the Super Bowl. They're the favorites to win the Super Bowl. Are are they on the verge of taking a downturn? Yes, because the quarterback is forty. But that's obvious. I, I mean, at some point, Father Time has to catch up to Tom Brady. The big issue with the Patriots has to deal with uh, Alex Guerrero, sort of Tom Brady's personal fitness guru. Uh, and, and the Patriots have never liked him being around. They've dealt with it because that's what you do when you have a superstar player. 
you kind of deal with these types of things. It became the bigger problem when other people on the Patriots started to buy in and, and they're saying to themselves, well, we don't want average players not doing the, the kind of common sense things from a rehabilitation standpoint, whether it's injury, whether it's fitness. Uh, we can't have other players doing that kind of stuff. It's one thing for the superstar. It's another thing for the you know, 50th guy on the roster. Uh, and, and that's where the issue comes in. But to say the Patriots, uh, I, I mean, there's politics in every NFL locker room. It's one of the major reasons I think Doug Peterson deserves so much credit here is because of the way he's been able to navigate those things as, as opposed to some other coaches in the league that are, uh, have been disasters at it, like Ben McAdoo, for instance, uh, who couldn't handle his locker room at all. These kinds of things happen all over. The Patriots' resume is the Patriots' resume. Uh, the five Super Bowls, they're the number one seed again. Where are these cracks? I wish there were cracks. Not to mention, this was a team that had some issues defensively this year that could have caused some tensions. and could. To, they worked through having some issues this year. Sure. I, I mean, I, I, I've said it all year on this show. They don't have a ton of talent. Uh, on the front seven on defense, uh, yet they're able to cobble together away. I, I mean, if you look at these rosters in the playoffs, uh, in the NFC is certainly much deeper than the AFC. I, I wouldn't say you have obviously uh, 12 teams left. I, I would say from a talent standpoint, the Patriots are on the back end of that list. Uh, yet, they're, they have the best record tied with the Eagles. They have a number one seed. And they're the favorites uh, from Las Vegas standpoint to win another Super Bowl. And I, I don't know many people who are going against that. I, I mean, I could certainly see Pittsburgh upsetting them. Uh, but they look in a very good position uh, to make another run for a Super Bowl title. Hey, John, I happen to see go across the wire that the Ravens have promoted – Greg Roman to an assistant head coach position. You have talked on this show before about how the assistant coaches are more valuable sometimes in that movement, trying to keep those guys than the head coaching movements. Is that a case where the Ravens are trying to prevent some other head coach somewhere else from scooping them up? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, the Ravens, uh, a lot of people wanted Marty Morningwig out uh, as the offensive coordinator. He's going to be back. It's obviously been – that's a team used to going to the playoffs, and now all of a sudden uh, they've had this playoff drought. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's always important uh, to keep good assistance. And, and in Greg's case, he got the, uh, the extra title. Uh, if you're an old Cheers fan, that's always one of my favorite episodes. <laughs> uh, I'm dating myself, but uh, when they couldn't give you a, a raise, they would give you a title. <laughs> that's sort of what the assistant head coach title is. Hey, John, a uh, couple things uh, as we get ready for Wild Card Weekend on the games. I want to kind of just get a quick uh, blurb on each game from you. Uh, tell us which way you're leaning. And, uh, Chiefs Tennessee is the first game on Saturday. Yeah, I think that's the clearest cut one. Uh, I think the Chiefs win that game easily. Uh, I just don't think uh, – I, I think it's – you know, I think Tennessee took that first step, and it's an important step in their development. Uh, but I don't think they're ready uh, at this stage to give the Chiefs even a run for their money in that game. Saturday night, uh, Rams against the defending NFC champion Falcons. Yeah, and that's a big game for the Eagles, obviously. We'll know after that game who they're going to play in the divisional round. I, I have a feeling the Falcons are going to go in there and upset the Rams, uh, and then it's going to be the Falcons coming here for the divisional round. Uh, it, part of it is, is the lack of experience uh, with the head coach uh, and the quarterback. Uh, Rams are obviously a very talented team. The, the Falcons are tested made the Super Bowl run last year. I think now that they're in, uh, I think they're in a position to create some noise. Uh, 
Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if you see the Atlanta Falcons in the NFC Championship game again. Uh, we'll do our picks coming up in just about six minutes from now. Jacksonville, Buffalo, McCoy, um, you know, he's really, even if he plays, they're a considerable underdog. Yeah, and they listed him as questionable. I don't know if he does play, how effective he's going to be, especially against that defense. And it's so many interesting scenarios in that game. If you think about Doug Marone, uh, the head coach in Jacksonville, how things ended with him uh, in Buffalo, and also Marcel Darius. They traded him down to Jacksonville uh, and made that front even more talented. So neither, obviously neither team has much. Uh, playoff experience so you can't hang your hat on that but you can hang your hat on the Jaguars defense I I don't know how the Bills are going to score many points uh, against that defense and uh, a game which could be a big one for Philly fans if the Rams win on Saturday night would be the late Sunday afternoon game in the south New Orleans and Carolina yeah I think that's going to be the closest game the toughest game obviously they know each other uh, from the NFC South. They play each other two times a year. Now this will be a third time. I think it's going to be really uh, nip and tuck the entire way, uh, and you, you kind of lean on, on home field in that type of situation. Uh, and I think ultimately New Orleans comes out with the win, but that one is tough to pick because we always talk about division games being closer than you expect. Well, division games between – really good teams that really know each other. Uh, it, it, it's a coin toss, but you, you got to look towards Drew Brees and the Saints. All right, uh, Johnny Mack here uh, on the Sports Bash, of course. Uh, we'll find out who the Eagles will play. We'll dive into that game started on Monday show right here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Have a good weekend, pal. Hey, thank you, guys.